Hey everybody, we're going to talk about the Cold War today. And um, the Cold War is going to happen after World War II ends. We talked about World War II last week, um, you know, at least as much as I had time to. But World War II is going to leave Europe even more devastated than World War I was. Uh, the advanced technology of World War II allows armies to destroy more property. The, the technology of World War II allows people to um, armies to destroy more lives. And there was this real worry that the same thing that happened after World War I with an economic depression, a collapse worldwide, they really thought that was going to happen after World War II. Well, the Second Depression, a lot of people say, was stopped by something called the Marshall Plan. Uh, it's named by a guy named George Marshall. He was the U.S. Secretary of State during World War II. And he came up with this plan to give Europe $12 billion worth of aid. That'd be about $172 billion today. And this aid was available to any of the war-torn countries of Western Europe who would accept it. It was even offered to the communist countries, but they weren't allowed to take it because Russia said no. But it's going to eventually lead to something called the European Economic Community, or the Common Market. And the EEC, the European Economic Community, is going to be kind of the forerunner of today's European Union. One of the main goals of the EEC was to eliminate trade barriers, strengthen national economies, and adopt a unified currency. And we have the unified currency today in the euro. So the, if it wasn't for the Marshall Plan, the EEC would never would have happened. And if the EEC hadn't happened, we wouldn't have the European Union today. Another really important thing that happens during the Cold War is the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations, it formed right after World War II. It's the successor, it's the continuation of the League of Nations. It's like the League of Nations 2.0, if you will. Uh, it's supposed to be a forum, a place where all the nations can discuss their issues and resolve conflicts. And for the most part, it has done its job. There have been a few places here and there where it hasn't. Uh, mainly like, you know, the Vietnam War, the Iraq War, a couple of things. But by and large, we haven't had any major worldwide issues since then, since World War II. And hopefully that won't happen. Um, unlike the League of Nations, the United States agrees to join and the United States becomes one of the main forces. It's uh, one of the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. And while the United Nations it does a great job of stopping conventional wars, it doesn't stop war of ideas, uh, ideologies if you will. Now the Cold War is a war of alliances. I bet you haven't heard that before. Um, this war of alliances. Uh, you've got a couple different alliances. In the Western world, you've got NATO, which is still around today, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, you used to have something called CETO, uh, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. That disappeared in the early 80s, if I remember correctly. And that was like South Korea, South Vietnam, uh, I think Singapore was in there, places like that. You also have something called ANZUS, which is the Australia, New Zealand, and United States Security Treaty. That is still in existence today, as far as I know. And then you have the OAS, the Organization of American States. And by American states, we're not talking about the 50 states, we're talking about North and South America. So all of those are different alliances that worked together during the Cold War. Uh, the Communist alliances, there was really just one, and that was the Warsaw Pact. The Warsaw Pact, it was led by the Soviet Union, or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. That's where the USSR comes from. And then the Eastern European countries that were, quote, liberated by, by the uh, Soviet Union. So places like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, they all become part of this Warsaw Pact, too. Uh, Mongolia is kind of weird. Mongolia wanted to join the Warsaw Pact and they end up getting what's called observer status, but they could never officially join because the Soviet Union and China didn't really like each other very much and they were going to fight over Mongolia if Mongolia joined. Now there's some battlefields you have to talk about. Before I do battlefields, your word of the day is going to be a little bit early in this video, about five minutes in.
the word of the day is grass, G-R-A-S-S. -S. Uh, it's about time for people to start mowing their grass. In fact, I did that today, so uh, your word of the day is grass. But um, your third world countries are going to become your battlefield. Um, Western style countries and communist style countries, they're all interested in these third world countries. And originally third world had a different meaning than today. Um, originally a third world country was just a country that was neither in the free or Western camp or the communist camp. They were kind of seen as other. Today a third world country is usually seen as poor and run down, but that's not what the original meaning was. Um, they're usually going to be located in Southeast Asia or Africa, so at one point in time Vietnam would have been considered a third world country. Most of the African countries were third world. India and Pakistan were considered third world. And typically these third world countries are going to be rich in resources, rich in manpower. Uh, they're going to be in strategic or important locations, but they're usually going to not have much economic development. They're not going to have a lot of political strength. And a lot of those countries are in Africa simply because of the way colonization ended in Africa. Uh, we also have nuclear weapons. You have to talk about those with the Cold War. Um, so weapons are going to be a key factor in the Cold War. Um, you got to remember the United States is the only country in the world who has used nuclear weapons against an enemy. Uh, you've got the bombing of Hiroshima that was on August 6th, 1945, and then the bombing of Nagasaki, August 9th, 1945. They end World War II, but this arms race begins. Um, by the time you get to 1960, there are six different countries with nuclear capabilities. Uh, it was originally just the United States. The Soviet Union, they get the ability to do uh, nuclear weapons in 1949 or 1950, one of the two. And then China develops nuclear weapons, England, France, and India. Now, India might seem kind of unusual, but they're afraid of both sides. They're afraid of both the Western world and the communist world. So they develop nuclear weapons to protect themselves from everybody. Uh, today, Israel has nuclear weapons. It's suspected that North Korea has nuclear weapons. And uh, Pakistan does have nuclear weapons. Um, and then there's been one country in the world who has voluntarily given up its nuclear weapons. Uh, South Africa voluntarily dismantled its nuclear program in 1989. They tested a bomb successfully. They made a couple of them, and then they said, you know what, we don't need this, and they turned everything over to the United Nations. Now, there are going to be new types of bombs that are developed. Uh, the original bombs were nuclear were, uh, uranium and plutonium. One was a fission bomb, one was a fusion bomb. Uh, don't ask me which was which, because I don't remember. But they were both uh, fission and fusion, using uh, uranium or plutonium. Well, from there, they start building hydrogen bombs, and a hydrogen bomb is so powerful that it took an atomic bomb to begin the explosion of the hydrogen bomb. Uh, the, South, the Soviet Union is going to develop its own hydrogen bomb after the United States does, and both sides begin working on neutron bombs, which are radiation bombs, and then the Soviet Union develops a cobalt bomb, which is so destructive that it's never tested at full scale. There's also this idea called Mutually Assured Destruction, or MAD, and this is just lunacy to me. Um, basically, the idea was you point so many nuclear weapons at the enemy that the enemy doesn't push the button to launch their nuclear weapons at you. Because if you push the button, you know the other side's going to push the button, and then everybody dies. So mutually assured destruction becomes a thing, and we talk about it a lot in U.S. history when we get to the 1960s. Now the biggest battlefield is going to be the Soviet Union versus the United States. Um, there were three main conferences during World War II. Uh, there was a conference at Tehran, which is in Iran. There was a treaty, there were, not a treaty, but there was a meeting at a place called Yalta that was in the Soviet Union. And then the third of those three meetings was the Potsdam Conference. So conference number one is at Tehran, which is in the country of Iran. Then the second one is at Yalta, and the third one is at Potsdam. 
This third conference at Potsdam goes so bad that a lot of historians say that was what started the Cold War. Um, in 1945, when the Potsdam Conference had, uh, had happened, Franklin D. Roosevelt had just died. Harry Truman is coming there. Um, Harry Truman and Joseph Stalin didn't like each other, so Stalin doesn't attend. He sends his, his foreign minister, a guy named Molotov, and it's just a disaster. But what ends, up, what ends up happening is the United States comes up with this idea to contain communism. And the Truman Doctrine is very, very important in world history. Uh, it's released in 1947, and in the Truman Doctrine, Harry Truman, the President of the United States, says the U.S. must support free peoples around the world who are resisting efforts by outsiders or armed minorities to overthrow their governments. That is so important that I make my U.S. history students memorize that. One of the big battlefields between the United States and the Soviet Union is in Berlin right after the war ends. Um, there's going to be this dispute over who's going to control Germany. Originally, Germany is separated into sectors. Uh, France has control of part of Germany, so does Britain, so does the United States, and so does Russia or the Soviet Union. The United States, France, and Great Britain unite their parts of Germany together and that becomes West Berlin or West Germany. And then the Soviet part, they don't let Germany unite and so that becomes East Germany. Well, Berlin is actually located within what was East Germany and Berlin was separated in four parts just like Germany was. So just like France, Britain, and the United States unite their parts of Germany, they unite their parts of Berlin. So you end up with two different countries, West Germany and East Germany, and then you end up with two different cities, West Berlin and East Berlin. Well, Joseph Stalin, he wanted control of all of Berlin, so he blockades the city. Uh, he tries to starve out the city and make the, the Western world give it up. Well, the United States, in 1948, they're going to fly in two and a half million tons of supplies. We're talking food, fuel, everything that West Berlin needed to survive for 10 months is brought in by airplane. Now, eventually, uh, Joseph Stalin's going to admit that his blockade is a failure. He's going to let people into the city and out of the city again. But eventually, he's going to authorized the building of a wall that are known as the Berlin Wall. And the Berlin Wall is going to separate West Berlin from the rest of the world. Um, the Berlin Wall did not just separate East Berlin and West Berlin. The Berlin Wall went all the way around the western part of the city. A lot of people are surprised by that. Uh, in response, the United States government, they're going to release something called NSC-68. And that's going to be published in 1950. And NSC 68 is going to change history. Um, what this government document says is the United States must take the lead in stopping communism wherever it occurs, regardless of the intrinsic, strategic, or economic value of that area to the U.S. Basically, the United States is going to stop communism wherever. If communism comes to Canada, the U.S. is going to stop it. If communism comes to South Africa, they're going to stop it. If communism comes to your bathroom, the United States is going to stop it. That's the entire goal of NSC 68. So if you ever want to know why the American military is so big today, this is the number one reason, NSC 68, because of communism. Another big deal is in Cuba. Um, in the late 50s, Cuba was actually controlled by a dictator named Fulgencio Batista. He's very unpopular amongst the Cuban people, but he was anti-communist, so the United States supported him. Well, a guy named Fidel Castro, you've probably heard of him before, uh, he tries to lead a rebellion in Cuba, and at first the rebellion is peaceful. In fact, Castro goes on to the uh, Ed Sullivan show, which was a big show in the 60s. Castro goes to uh, talk to the vice president at the time, who was Richard Nixon. And Castro's going to ask the United States for support. Unfortunately, some of Castro's ideas sound like communism, so we turn them down. Well, 
Castro is going to turn to the Soviet Union and he is going to become a hardcore communist after the United States turns him down. Now, in 1959, the United States plans something called the Bay of Pigs invasion. Um, the CIA is going to train operatives to invade Cuba, and that uh, attack is launched in April of 1961. It's a complete disaster. Castro and the Cuban government know that it's going to happen, and the invaders are met at the beach by the Cuban army. Uh, moving on from that, in early October of 1962, uh, U.S. spy planes fly over Cuba and they discover that the Soviet Union are, is building um, missile silos in Cuba and they have nuclear weapons in them. So the president in 1962, John F. Kennedy, uh, goes on TV, calls out the Soviet Union and demands that these, these weapons be removed. And he says, if you don't remove them, we will remove them for you. So the world almost goes to war in 1962, but thankfully at the last minute, the Soviet Union and the United States, they reach an agreement and the missiles are removed. All right, we also have the race to the moon. Um, this is gonna be the race to the moon uh, by the Soviet Union and the United States. In October 1957, the very first satellite is launched. It was called Sputnik 1. Uh, Sputnik 1 wasn't very big. It was about the size of a Volkswagen bus, if you've seen those before. And all it did was it let out a ping. It flew over the, around the world. It was up for, I think, a uh, month and a half. And you could turn the radio on and you hear it go ping, ping, ping. And this scared the daylights out of people. Um, the future president, and at that time, senator from Texas, Lyndon B. Johnson is on record saying, I refuse to sleep under the light of a damned communist moon. So that shows you how afraid America was of this. Uh, Sputnik 2 is launched in November of 1957, and the first animal in space was on that satellite, a dog named Laika. Uh, Laika did not have a happy ending. Um, Laika dies very, very shortly after launch. And it's not until 1958 that the United States is able to launch their first man-made object into space, and it's a, a satellite called Explorer 1. Now, I mentioned that Laika goes into space for the Russians. Uh, the United States is going to send chimpanzees into space. The first chimpanzee into space is in 1961. It's a chimpanzee named Ham. So, now we are going to send people into space. And the United States really tried to be the first to send a person to space, but in April of 1961, a Soviet Union uh, test pilot named Yuri Gagarin um, is the first one to circumnavigate or uh, orbit the Earth, if you will. Alan Shepard does it about a month later for the Americans. So the United States then makes it a point to go to the moon first. And NASA is created in the late 1950s, and in 1961, John F. Kennedy makes it a point to declare that the United States will get to the moon by the end of the 1960s. So the Mercury program, the Gemini program, and the Apollo program are all developed to further that mission to get to the moon. And finally, on, a, on a July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 lands on the moon with uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And the third guy who didn't ever get to the moon, he was still up in the Apollo uh, spacecraft, was named Michael Collins. So you always have to remember there were three people. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, very famous. Michael Collins was there too. All right, that is it for, for this. Um, next time we're going to talk a little bit more about um, Korea and Vietnam. And then uh, just a little word for you, next week on Monday, your final exam is going to go live. Um, yesterday, actually, we got news from our, our online directors that we need to make the final exam available to you for an entire week. So I'm going to put it up on Monday, but I want you to know that Tuesday there will be one last lecture, so you may not want to take it until you hear Tuesday's lecture next week. So we've got this video, we've got Thursday's video, and then we've got one more video on Tuesday of next week, and then we'll be done for the semester.
So keep working on your SLOs, keep working on your museum reviews, and I hope you enjoyed the video. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.